Hello and welcome to our lecture this evening on small modular reactors by our guest speaker Matthew Blake. So this lecture will cover the development of a nuclear power station design using a small modular reactor. So a little bit of information about our guest speaker Matthew Blake. So Matthew is a chartered engineer, a fellow of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers and a member of the Nuclear Institute and the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. He is also a registered European engineer. Matthew joined Rolls-Royce as a professional engineer in 1992, having previously been an offshore exploration drilling engineer with BP. Currently, Matthew is the chief engineer for the, nuclear, for the future nuclear power station development programmes, which he manages based out of Derby and for which he represents both Rolls-Royce and the SRM const uh, Constorium. Previously, he has held several positions in the Rolls-Royce submarines business covering reactor design, test and operation. He has led the business's development of the next generation nuclear propulsion plan and he has been seconded to the Ministry of Defence undertaking special programme work. Matthew has worked at, mut at multiple locations in both the UK and overseas, engaged with and managing projects covering both reactor design and assembly and supporting civil facilities. Enjoy. Brilliant. So, what I'm going to talk to you today, guys, about the Rolls-Royce small modular reactor. Now, that in itself is, is a bit of a misnomer because it's not really about the reactor. This is a power station solution. And as we go through this presentation, we'll, we'll understand why this has to be a power station. That's the first point. The, the second point is you'll see in the top of this slide. This is a consortium effort. This is a UK effort. Rolls Royce is leading this enterprise. He's leading this activity. He's leading the development of this nuclear power station. But we, we can't do this on our own. So, so we head a consortium of leading companies within the UK's nuclear sector to develop this UK product base. So that's the sort of context of what we're going to cover today. On we're going to cover how the power station developed and what the conditions are that, that, that drive us to this solution. You, you heard a bit about myself. I'll just introduce myself a bit more fully so you know who you're talking to. I've been in Rolls Royce since '92. I, I started down in Devonport Dockyard. I've been in the submarine business for 20 years um, prior to moving into civil nuclear. Um, Rolls Royce is a is a family business as far as far as I concern. I think my family's got six hundred years within Rolls Royce. My father designed Vanguard class. My brother works in submarines. My grandparents all built jet engines. So Rolls Royce is a family business as far as I concern. I've been here forever. Submarines for a long time, and latterly within civil nuclear. So let's move to the first slide. So what I'm going to cover, uh, this is important. We need, to, we need to understand the conditions of the market. We need to understand the global conditions for energy, because one of the questions that we have to answer is why nuclear? Why now? Why SMR? When we sort of establish those to the ground rules, we'll then talk quickly about what the power station looks like, what it involves. What the technical solution to some of the problems that, that we see are and then we'll finish by understanding economics in this world today everything is driven by economics in, in in many respects my role leading the design of the power station is straightforward in terms of engineering in the difficult bit is matching the economics and and demonstrating the social benefit of, of what we're doing so we'll cover these three things as as we go through this presentation and hopefully you'll get around an understanding of, of, of what we're doing here so <clears throat> the big thing carbon the last year covid notwithstanding and Starting about 18 months ago, you'll have seen an intensity and a change in public opinion. You will have seen climate awareness, climate activism, activism increasing globally. You will understand that the threat to the way we live through both climate change and obviously the impact of carbon on that is becoming a, a much higher priority in everybody's um, 
way of life and understanding and we we cannot be immune from that so this is the context in which we we sit and it, this this picture here shows you that in stark in stark um, relief those that have a high nuclear and hydro and hydro intensity have a low carbon those that are reliant on fossil fuels have a high carbon output and this is a picture that is mapped globally and it is a picture that public opinion and society in general wants politicians and engineers like ourselves to find a solution to. This is the big background. This is why SMR now. SMR now because the point has been reached where we have to find low carbon solutions to our ever increasing energy need. We also have to understand that tomorrow's energy market is going to be fundamentally different to, to, to what we see now. We've just spoken about the, the drive for carbon free energy, but we, we know that there is an increasing demand for use of electricity in, in all sorts of applications from, from heating through to cooling, propulsion of vehicles, generation of other clean technologies such as hydrogen and in, in, in your cases for, for the aerospace world for, for SAF. This is all driven by demand for electricity. So this means that the market is essentially going to change dramatically over over the next decade. As even now grid infrastructures can't cope with the demand that we're potentially going to see, the generation capacity within countries can't cope with the demand that we're potentially going to see. So you're going to see a big increase in in that um, infrastructure challenge within within countries across Europe and more and globally. But also the realization around big users such as steel, such as hydrogen productions, and we'll see some more of this on the next slide. But actually it is economic and beneficial to own your own generation capability, your own low carbon generation capability. And again, this touches on nuclear, why nuclear? Most of those applications, certainly from an industrial basis, require continuity of supply, require continuity of, of, of power. It cannot deal with intermittency that, that quite a lot of renewables actually provide to the grid. So consequently, if you want low carbon and you want continuous base load supply, then you have to look to technologies that can provide that. And nuclear is one of the only that can provide that. So this slide tells us that the context of the electrical, electric, electricity and grid infrastructure is going to change dramatically as we move forward. And it, for those of you that, that follow COP26 coming later in the year, You'll see various undertakings by governments, governments at that point that drive this agenda, that drive that decarbonisation, that drive that electrification. And that electrification needs to be met by a generation capacity. And to give you an idea of, of, of where we sit and, and what we're talking about here, you know, the market that we are playing into in the SMR world, our plant, 14, 17 megawatt electric, so that, that can produce 170 tons of hydrogen or 280 tons of synthetic fuel per day. We can desalinate a lot of water. And you shouldn't underestimate as the populations grow. It may not be a particular issue in the UK where it rains a lot, but in, in large parts of the world where, where water is the primary commodity that people need. The, the demands of desalination with ever increasing population become increasingly important and we can do about 500 million cubic meters per year of potable water. We can heat or cool something the size of Sheffield and you know you can power a city the size of Leeds um, if you want to do direct electricity supply. So what we're talking about here is generating capability that can can produce this sort of effect on society. And again, back to my point about what people are going to be using electricity for 
going forward. And, and the bottom four points on the left are, are quite interesting. A single data center. So if Microsoft or Google their single data centers, you know, have up to a gigawatt of constant electrical power required to feed that data center. And the UK might have as many as four data centers to service its needs. Data centers globally are looking at 23 gigawatts today of power required. Bitcoin data mining from Bitcoin is 13 gigawatts alone. And to give you a hint, Netherlands uses 13 gigawatts of power. So power demand is ever increasing. SMI is a solution to it that can meet quite a lot of these needs. And you have to look to other applications that, that may not be today's issues, such as the availability of potable water, such as the availability of clean fuels as a growing need for that technical solution. So that's the sort of backstrop, why SMR why now? There is a growing need for low carbon electricity generation as we go forward and certainly over the next decade, that demand will increase and it will increase not in areas that you would traditionally think such as, as transportation and domestic, but in big industrial applications for managing service economies around data centers, around lifestyle choices. Um, and on top of that, the continual electrification of transportation. So the world of power is changing and the demand for low carbon is growing. So this is where we step into the into the into the frame. We started this around 2015. Um, at that point, the government were looking at whether a smaller variation of a nuclear power station might better fit um, the demands of both industry and domestic supply. And so we started looking at, at SMRs in this application, a power station for, for, for uh, around that time. However, Rolls-Royce has been in this game uh, looking at non-military reactors um, since the late 80s, early 90s, and this, this, this safe integral reactor that you see here um, was, was once the solution we came up to to deal with to deal with a more commercial commercial problem around generating power from nuclear. Um, <clears throat> but we derived this problem, this this program, sorry, based around a cost of power, and we'll go into that in a minute. And that drove a certain set of characteristics for our power station that you'll see that, that, it, that it isn't particularly small, but it is modular and it's not just a reactor. And this, this is the point of this slide that Rolls has been doing this for a while. So, so that we know what we're doing. But we are letting the economics drive this. So I have no technical constraint on the solution that I can I can derive other than it has to be suitable for the market and it has to be affordable for the market. So based on our current experience, we're, we're driving the solution. And I'll show you some pictures of it in, in a moment. But um, I think it's important that we go back to, to how you derive the design. How do you produce a power station that, that people want to buy? So we started the study back, this was early 2016, and we started the study back and we spoke to various utilities and, and we soon drew the conclusion that uh, electrical utility is not interested in technology. They're interested in one thing only, they're interested in selling their electricity. And their whole world is governed by this equation here, levelized cost of electricity, LCO. And the cost of electricity is, is given by a number of, a number of key attributes. Cost of the capital, how much does it cost you to actually physically purchase a power station? I mean, this became an important parameter for us in that if you think Hinkley Point C, which is a 1.3 gigawatt power station, will be north of 24 billion by the time it's finished, that is way too expensive for the power. It tells this equation tells us we've got to be around the 1.6 to 1.9 billion capital cost per power station mark. And the second point here, management of investment, illustrates that the dominant cost in building power stations is not 
the physical cost of the equipment and more than the civil engineering. It's actually the cost of borrowing and the loans it take, takes to actually finance that power station and the time it takes to return uh, the investment. So normally a power station build cycle is quite long, um, can be up to 10 years. So you're making no money over that 10 year period before you start generating. So you have to manage the investment cost. You have to reduce the operation and maintenance cost. Um, you, know, you guys are involved in, in the aerospace business. You're all very familiar with the effect of operating cost on the cost of your product. And it's the same within power generation that the operating cost must be as low as possible. And then you have the, the sort of health factors across the bottom. So you need to maximize the power. So you need to maximize the amount of power that you can sell. You need to maximize the amount of time that power is available to be sold. And you have to reduce your prime cost, and which in our case is the fissile material itself, the fuel cost is the, is the dominant cost. But we are a nuclear power station. Um, and a nuclear power station has certain specific attributes, not least as I've just mentioned, the fissile material. And so therefore we have to bring into that requirement set in the development of that power station solution, a set of other requirements that are unique to highly regulated safety significant infrastructure. So we have a very strong regulator, we have to understand that. We have to understand how proliferation resistance, i.e. Stopping, stopping the bad guys getting our fuel works and how we manage that. We have to make sure market timing is right. We have to be co-compliant. We have to be compatible with existing infrastructures. And this is a really interesting one. Because as soon as you start talking to nuclear, you start talking about barriers to entry. You start talking about how difficult it is for other people to enter the market as competitors. And, and infrastructure within a country is important. You can only build. If I was to put two gigawatt, two, gig, two gigawatts on the grid, that would take probably three to four billion pounds of grid infrastructure improvements. If I was to choose a divergent fuel form for the for the reactor solution, that would again put four to ten billion pounds of infrastructure requirements that the state typically has to fund to service those power stations. So consequently, in order to manage the cost of the power station, the the investor appetite for it, and the willingness of any state or country to adopt that technology, it has to be compatible with stuff they already has. It has to sit within their current grid infrastructures, and it has to sit within their their um, capability of managing the waste streams from a nuclear power station. So that becomes a really important one for us. Public perception is very important for us. One of our previous directors said, "All nuclear is politics," and and. He, he was completely correct. We live and die by public perception. And part of the other reason why SMR now is that public acceptance of nuclear power has shifted dramatically over the last two years. Um, and that we are in a very positive place because they understand the risks of ownership are, are very low and the benefits against environment, environmental impact, again, are, are very advantageous. So public perception, we, we, we we understand and manage carefully. Matthew, Matthew, yeah. just sorry to uh, interrupt. Would yeah. you mind uh, uh, keeping your microphone a bit away from your uh, T-shirt if possible, because apparently there is a bit of noise. I will. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt to the flow. I've turned it off. I think it's bit, yeah, brilliant. it's better now. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, cool. So. We live and die by public perception. Um, now, utility familiarization, this becomes important. Again, you need people who will buy your product. This is also the macro version of, of, the, of the support infrastructure. A utility is not interested, as I mentioned, they're interested in selling electricity. They're not interested in sponsoring new technology. They're not interested in that investment. They're not interested in a wholesale change to their technical and training structures to manage any new technology. So we have to bring that into the equation. Again, we have to build a product that people are going to buy. I mentioned up front that 
this is led by Rolls Royce. I also mentioned we are part of a consortium, and that is an important part within developing the design basis. Rolls has strengths. It doesn't do certain things like civil engineering. It doesn't do big logistics. Um, you need other people who can bring those strengths with you, and you design the plant to the strengths of that delivery partnership, and this becomes a, a key consideration. And then global market, we clearly want to sell this extensively. This isn't just a product that we want to exploit in the UK. Um, we want to exploit this globally. So the design solution has to be compliant with what the majority of people in the world wish to adopt. So this becomes the heart of what drives the power station. Um, and this is the basis of the requirement set for everything that we have achieved going forward. The other thing here and the unwritten the unwritten rule, Rolls-Royce, you know, we, we, we've been designing nuclear reactors for, for 50 odd years now. But the penny did drop that nobody's building a power station with a hole in it for a nuclear reactor. You can't just build a reactor and try and sell that into a market. You have to provide a full power generation solution, which means you have to provide a power station and everything that goes with it from the turbines through to the support system and through to the civil engineering. So we then took a long look at what everybody else was doing in the, in the market. Um, and at the time, and, and that this number has reduced, there was about 60 other people or organisations designing what you would regard as, as SMRs. That number has subsequently reduced as competition and, and sort of having to get serious as, as we know that herd. And they, and those 60 odd people, those 60 odd organisations fell into four sort of key buckets. There were those that were purely scientific reactors. They were never going to be power reactors, so we, we, we knew we could exclude them. There were those sets of SMR designs that were really paperwork exercises that allowed host governments to play with the International Atomic Energy Authority, a play in the UN, join the top table for certain discussions. So again, they, they weren't relevant to us. There were those group of reactors that really thinly veiled programs to hide military ambition. So again, we don't have to worry about them, but there are a hardcore of, of, of reactors, mainly in, uh, in China, uh, Russia and the US, France at the time, that were serious power reactors that looked for, that were gonna be a commercial out, out, output that would, that would feed the market. And we examined closely what those what those reactor and power station solutions, where they were spending their money against where we understood the risk to be. And the, the other SMR graph here is instructive. Most of them were spending their money on reactor, fuel cycle, some on control systems, because clearly control systems go obsolete as soon as you, as you put them in, so you have to you generate that. Nobody was putting money into civil engineering, nobody was putting money into manufacturing technology, and nobody had a a long term view of the effect of digital and digital ecosystems on how you deliver designs to the market. Now, we did a, a critical risk assessment of major nuclear programs, and typically, nuclear programs are typified by on time or to cost, choose one, and sometimes on time and to cost, you can't have either. Um, neither of which is is viable long term. What drove that, we looked at the risks of what drove that and they were clearly in, in two places. They were clearly in problems in civil engineering, problems late, late adoption of civil engineering design and optimization, late understanding of how the supply chain manufactured your product. And none of that connected by modern communications and digital infrastructure to, to help solve some of those problems. So we know that, we knew that, as well as having a, a requirement set that I've just gone over, there was a critical need for us to change the way that we invested in innovation, 
that we drove the product from an investability standpoint, that we therefore manage down the risk so that we can absolutely guarantee delivery when we say we're going to deliver at the lowest possible risk. So you can see from these graphs where we're spending our money within the design basis is in subtly different places to where everybody else is, is spending their money. So we have a hard requirement set that looks squarely at what it will take to make this attractive, make this an attractive uh, proposition to the market and to investors, and a, a hard technology policy that looks at driving innovation and spending money where it provides maximum advantage to um, to to the program. So let's get to it. This is what it looks like. This is the this is the power station. This had a number of iterations. Some of you may have seen the previous one, which was much more of a curved structure. And I'll go through some of the features of this in a moment. But it's fundamentally a 470 megawatt electric, which is the size of electrical output, 1350 megawatt thermal, which is the, basically the size of the reactor core. Um, it will operate for 18 to 24 months, and we haven't optimized where in that period it'll land yet between refueling intervals and the area inside the berm so the berm's the big green background on the outside is is 49,000 square meters or just under five hectares so we get away from the word small it's, you know small it's small in terms of it isn't 1.3 gigawatt power station it's a it's a 470 megawatt power station but it is still quite a big piece of infrastructure um, and this is what it, this is the this is the south of france view of of what the power station would look like at that time with the power station under the big under the big um, canopy at the back um, the auxiliary systems under the under the under the fault roof you see just in front of it and then the office block at the front there and this will house I suppose at any one time there'll be 90 people working within this facility on a three shift basis. So the anatomy of the nuclear power station. Now some of this is quite circumspect because quite a lot of this is, is hard export control. But the power station or our power station is simplistically broken into, into three main areas. There's the reactor island I'll come, to what in, I'll come to what's in these areas in, in a while. The turbine island, and that is the turbine and generation systems, and then cooling water. So typically what we do is we use nuclear heat within the reactor to generate hot water, which goes through a primary to secondary heat exchanger, which generates steam. That steam turbine that steam runs into the turbine island and drives a, a single high, high pressure and two low pressure steam turbines. And then that drives an electrical generator. And if we look across the bottom, we see the, the detail of that. That steam pops out of the steam turbine and gets cooled by the cooling water island, which in our case is driven by cooling towers, and we'll see pictures of it or images of that in a moment. And then we turn back into the system and the whole system is recycled. And that system will run continuously for, I, th I think we'll end up at around 21 months before we have to refuel the, before we have to refuel the core. And that refueling operation will take nine to 11 days. And then we're back on grid again, running for a, a further, say 21 months and that, that will happen for 60 years which is the lifetime of this plant. Now looking at the pictures at the bottom we break down each one of these things into the critical activities that we have to do so we'll start at the bottom left so what you see bottom left is the sort of left hand end of the reactor island it's all about fuel management it's not labeled because to label it would be would make it export controlled but that whole area is about is about managing new fuel, and managing used fuel. We take our used fuel 
we, we insert fresh clean fuel into the reactor, we burn it for, for the period of 21 odd months, we then take that fuel out, store it within a pond for six years, at which point the temperature of the fuel has dropped sufficiently that we can take it out of that pond, encapsulating it in in transport containers, which we ground in place with, with a, a specialist cement. And then they sit on a pad awaiting the UK's policy on, on deep, deep depository disposal. And they will sit there until in all conditions under all under all threats for, for as long as we need them to. Um, and over the period of of this of this power station, that fuel volume will run to about this about a Olympic slide swimming pool and a half. So the area we take up with with long term storage of used fuel over that 60 year period is about the same size as, as one and a half Olympic swimming pools. And that's what that stuff on the bottom left indicates it is the fuel handling capability and that's the tall building you see sort of within the reactor island area. And then you've got the reactor itself, the heart of the enterprise, the kettle. Um, the sole job is to generate hot water. The reactor vessel there, and to give you an idea of scale, the, the steam generators, the blue vessels are, um, are around 20, 22 meters high, something of, something of that order. The, the reactor pressure vessel itself is around 18, it'll be 18 to 20 meters in, in height. Around fully loaded, around 450 tons in weight, but the actual vessel itself being around 200 to 250 tons, depending on, on where we end up. And it's interesting because people ask me why, why 470 megawatts? Why did you pick? pick that number, why is it sort of 1356 megawatt thermal? It's, we asked the market, we asked the utilities about what their sweet spot for power would be. We went to National Grid and asked them where their sweet spot for power would be. And, and they both came back and said, whatever, they want the maximum power in the most economic form. So basically it's about how cheaply you can build the, it's about how cheaply you can build the power station. Um, so the next limiting factor becomes road transportation. This has to be road transportable. So consequently the biggest reactor pressure vessel that we can transport in the UK is around four and a half meters in diameter. So the biggest core that I can throw into a four and a half meter diameter reactor pressure vessel with a reasonable wall thickness is a 1356 megawatt core using four and a half percent standard enriched uranium. So it's, it's these things that end up driving the size of the power station and, and, the, and the end of the day the economics. So the reactor there is is 1356 megawatt core driven that drives the three reactor coolant pumps going to three steam generators that provide a three steam train into the turbine island which in, in this design here is, is a Siemens unit. Um, and we basically re recirculate the heat through the MSR. So we take it through the high pressure turbine, which is the very small turbine you see at the front, and then, then out through the MSR. So we circulate the heat then into the low pressure turbine and try and take as much energy out as we can before it goes underneath into the, into the condensers to get recirculated back into the seed generators and round again. And the turbine drives the generator and, and that's the point of the exercise, the, the, the electrical generation from that generator which then drives straight to our switchboard room and out, and out to the grid. Um, so it is a relatively simple, simple ranking cycle. But there is a lot of energy there and to the extent that the cooling water you know, we have to chill the, cool, the, the, the steam down to, to usable temperatures to try and get the, the enthalpy correct, you know, heat balance correct. So the cooling water island, which is, which is on the back end, is, is driven in our case by cooling towers and again pictures in a minute of that. But it is three large pits 
there of water taken from either the ocean, a large river or, or a lake, we're agnostic to the, to the water source that provides that backup power. And just to give you an idea of scale on here, those pits are about 25, 30 metres deep. The, the, the structure around the, the um, reactor island is 50 to 55 metres high. So you know, this is the sort of size that we're dealing with um, within the solution. And that is really it. That is really the power station. There's clearly a lot of control around that. There's really a lot of safety and auxiliary systems that we have to build into this control systems, welfare, all the other things you would expect in a power station, which drives the size of it, but the heart of it, the actual the, the steam and the ranking cycle itself is, is driven by these, these three big things. So externals. So why have I shown this? Because there's, there's a few esoteric things that are the nuclear power station are, are quite important. You see here an image of, of of a double unit because ideally we don't want to build single, we can of course build single units, but we, multi, building multiple units is, is better um, from, a, from an economics perspective unless you're just a, an optic rendition of, of a double unit. Now the cooling towers that you see here, mechanical draft cooling towers, would sit between these two units. And why cooling towers? Well normally for a large power station, certainly in the UK, you would have direct cooling, which would mean running large tunnels out into the ocean with the consequential impact of the marine environment, the consequential potential for under worst case conditions contaminating the, the marine environment. The environmental permitting around, around that solution is, is quite challenging. So we're going for cooling towers and this is a modular cooling tower form you just you just add more cooling towers or less cooling towers depending on your dominant environmental conditions um, and, that, and that drives the cooling for the whole of the power station and then what it means also is that we are agnostic to the water supply i don't need to be on the coast i i the mentioned i can be on the river the size of the trent is fine that can be on a reasonably large lake. It doesn't have to be overly large. It just has to be a continuous water supply, and it dry and it feeds, it feeds these cooling towers. The cooling towers also give us other opportunities as well. In that, quite a lot of the waste heat, waste heat can be used to, to drive other industrial applications, such as market gardening. You can drive significant greenhouse structures from and the waste heat from the from the cooling tower. So there are other reasons why you potentially want to go with cooling towers, but it also makes it site agnostic. So I think, you know, we talked about this global, this global uh, application of, of SMRs. If I go to the cooling tower, I can fit it in any country. I can fit it in the desert. I can fit it on the coast. It doesn't matter. I don't have to change the design basis. Um, and so that's why cooling towers. But the other thing that's just worth bringing out here, the Bund, the big green bank, is a dominant form. On a nuclear power station, we, we take security very, very seriously, as, as, as I hope you'd expect. And 20% of the cost of, of this product you, you see here is the security solution. Security costs a lot of money. To the extent that some of the threats that we have to, to manage from terrorists, from infiltration, from insider threat, are all managed better if we put it within a bund. So that bund is there as a, as a, as a significant security feature. It's also there to provide a significant element of tsunami resilience. Because the other thing apart from security is we have to take external hazard extremely seriously. And you'll have seen in Fukushima, where a tsunami had a significant impact on that particular power station. We now clearly have to learn from, from past errors. And so <clears throat> the bund here is actually hydrodynamically designed to break a wave um, and, and force the energy away from the power station as opposed to over and through it. Why have we gone for that dome? Why have we gone for the shrouding? There's an element of of public acceptability about why we've gone for the shrouding, but also we have to manage significant external hazards. One of them is 
a full momentum impact from a Boeing 777 is the is the design base aircraft impact that I have to protect, certainly the reactor against. Um, so the structures in there are designed to take that impact and we have under that structure, and it's relatively classified structure, is what we call a plane shredder and it will actually disrupt the plane on impact and protect the reactor. But then the structure around it is designed to deal with the kerosene fire. So. If I have a 50 meter structure with a flat roof and I have a plane land on it, then I get a big kerosene fire that I now have to deal with 50 meters in the air, which is a problem. If I build a roof that will shed that kerosene, it doesn't, doesn't minimize the, the hazard of dealing with a fire, but it puts it in a place at ground level that I am more able to manage that hazard. So designing this power station is more than just the 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 plant within the station that generates the power. There is a whole concept around how we assure and protect and maintain that power station in the same condition and the external structures are all part of that design solution. So I mentioned earlier that economics drives everything. Cost of borrowing is the dominant cost within any power station solution, that return on investment or that delayed return on investment. So from an engineering perspective, what is the dominant thing I have to worry about within the design basis? What do my team have to worry about within the design basis? Um, and that's really delivery on time, to quality and absolutely on time. How do you do that? Well, the big risk, as I've mentioned, is civil engineering and the variation you see in civil engineering and the, the difficulty um, of assuring a civil engineer product in a time scale that, that's, that's useful. And then we'll talk about what we're doing on site in a moment. But the whole premise of this design basis is we are trying to commoditize a nuclear power station. This works because it will be a fleet. And as soon as you start building a fleet, and we're looking at between 12 and 16 in the UK, uh, many more hopefully overseas, you can then start to put infrastructure in there that, that manages that build cycle. So we're, as I said, we're commoditizing a nuclear power station. So what we're doing is we're factory building. So it's no longer a construction program, it's more an installation program. Standardized product built in production lines with minimum cap with minimum optimized factory capital all controlled by digital twin and, and, and this is perhaps playing to the Rolls Royce's strength is how we how we commoditize that product how we streamline that manufacture so as part of this enterprise we'll talk about the fourth factory in a minute the side factory but as part of this enterprise we will be building at least three factories we will be building a primary factory to deal with the heavy, the, the high assurance, the very high reliability, large vessels that are required for the, for the reactor island. The whole plant will be modularized into either standard modules around a 1.4 meter grid or standard civil structures within a standard flat plate design. And there is a civil module, module factory already existing actually by loan by Lango Rourke, which will probably be extending uh, to deal with the volume output we require. And we will be building module facilities to deal with the MEP mechanical electrical plumbing modules for the entire power station. So the entire power station will essentially be built more like an oil rig than, than a traditional power station. And everything will be shipped to site. Um, and then installed in site. Now you'll see at the top there, groundworks and bearings. The dominant design input really is seismicity as far as we're concerned. That is the dominant hazard, it is the dominant, it is the dominant external risk, it is the dominant force we have to design against. And typically in the UK, in shear, we're probably designing about 0.3 of a G 
acceleration um, on, on the sort of soft ground conditions, which gives us various whipping issues. So how, how do I design a standardized product? How do I design a standardized power station? When if you look at any piece of ground in the UK, they're all different. The geology of the UK certainly is very varied. And if we're talking some of the countries that we potentially want to sell into around the Mediterranean, around the Middle East, all of which have very high seismic um, divergent ground conditions. How do you stop me having to qualify all my components to different seismic inputs? Um, well, we put it on a seismic bearing. So the whole the power station is being built on a seismic isolation. And you tune that seismic bearing, that seismic isolation to the local conditions. So the input to the power station above it is standardized at 0.3 of a G. So that becomes a, a, a very important characteristic of the power station. So and it allows what it allows is that commoditization. It allows me to have a standard product set going through the three factories that can be delivered to site, assembled, not constructed, and then commissioned and then put on grid. So this becomes, this is the USP, this is the, the real nugget, this is the bit that makes it work, this is the bit that makes the economic work, but it's also the most challenging, challenging element because the, the design intensity on getting this right is, is significant. So we talk about the fourth factory. The fourth factory is the site factory. So it occurred to us that part of the problem we have with any construction site is the construction site has a significant effect on the environment, dust, light, blasting, um, gaseous liquid pollution, it has a significant effect on personnel because, and you can see the graph at the bottom, because we get massive losses of time due to, to weather outage. So, you know, if, you, if you're building at World Free Wales in winter, you may as well stand everybody down for, for January, February and March because you're really going to get no, no building done. And the cost of that is 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 horrendous and you can see there over a four year period you're potentially losing 650 nearly days um, due to weather alone let alone development consent because everything has to be governed by the development consent order which means you have to save newts and wildlife and not have dust in public and not have lots of extraneous light so we came to the conclusion very quickly and again this is some of it was based on our experience of building submarines where for those that have been to Barrow will have seen a thing called the Devonshire Dock Horse, we build submarines indoors. Um, so we said, why don't we do the same for the power station? Um, and having that relatively compact site allows us to do that. So what you see there without the cladding on the outside is the temporary structure we will be building on day one um, at the site, which will be the site factory, and we will run it like a factory. It is an enclosed environment with swarm cranes and control processes. We can control welfare and health and safety better. We can control weather clearly. We can do blasting in there. We can control the environment much better. So this again is part of the innovation that we're driving and which is providing great interest to my manufacturing team because how they bring modern factory manufacturing methodology into a construction environment is, is the challenge they're facing and the reality is that that a modern construction site is not that dissimilar from a medieval construction site most of the processes are the same and so how do we make that 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 monumental shift in technology and methodology to get all the advantages we need to get this built in a sort of well, first of class, we're probably going to try and drive for a greenfield site to power on the grid in 5.8 years. And then with the learner curve, I uh, would hope to get that under four years from first cutting the first sod to actually power on the grid, which for, for a structure which has something like 45 million configurable parts is, is not a bad rate of achievement. So again, Four factories, 
three of them providing the products, the standardized product sets that, that are delivered to the, to the fourth factory, which is, which is the one that physically puts the power station together. So that's really the overview of the product and how we intend to put the product together. Just very quickly now, um, I think I'm overrunning slightly on, on the economics. And th this is the plan. This is the plan. We're currently in phase one, and that was basically co funded by, by um, UK government. They gave us 80 million quid. The industry has, has overmatched that, that funding, and that finishes later this month. I have the gated review for the last week in April, and that will finish this phase of the design. Um, I'll produce a design certificate and the master record index and, and that we will, we will baseline the design at that point and that's essentially taking us to the to the end of the preliminary concept phase. We then enter phase two of the funding <coughs> which is again co-funded by UK government around 210 million grant funding co-matched by investors this time and industry overmatched so I'll have around half a billion spend um in this between 21 and 24 and that and that time scale is movable because we do have options to accelerate this depending on what the uk's appetite for implementation is but on a medium point and that will take me through most of the regulatory process the generic design assessment with the regulator it will take me through most of the detailed design i will have completed the verification and validation um we will have chosen the sites and done the early development of the sites and, and sort of declared the first orders for those power stations will be in. And then that runs me to, I think it's going to be around beginning of 24, hopefully the end of 23, and then we get into the commercialization. So it's, it's basically into design implementation. It's long lead orders will be done in phase two, but then it's the bulk orders for all of the rest of the equipment on the power station at the start of the implementation, start of the build cycle and moving through to operation at the end of 2031. So it is a very racy program. It's 10 years from flash to bang. Um, and we're going to do it. We're going to do it because it's interesting. We're going to do it because it's hard. Um, and we're going to do it because the country really needs it. Um, so that's the program going forward and you know this affects lots of people there'll be multiple sites we've spoken about the factories there will be digital ops centers um, Springfield which is the UK's nuclear fuel facility will get a whole regeneration the AXR, AXRC network is is being involved in this so they'll all get a boost the supply chain will get a boost we think in the UK direct and indirect jobs, it's worth around 40,000 jobs, give or take, um, mainly across the North and Wales, um, but it is a significant and it will end up being the largest infrastructure programme in the UK should we get the full order, full order book. Um, and this is the areas you see here where we're all getting most benefit. And just the final slide here. And it's just about where we sit. I designed this plant, or my team designed this plant, with economics in mind. And this is the this is the chart that we continually have in the back of our mind. We have to make this product competitive with renewables to be continually attractive. And so, this is where we sit at the minute. In the Dell COE of 35 to 50, depending on, on, on which, which um, that's per megawatt hour, by the way. So 35 to 50 pounds per megawatt hour, depending on which one you look at, whether it's first of kind or, or end of kind. And at that rate, we are competitive with, with offshore and onshore wind. And that's where we need to stay to make this a viable, to make this an attractive proposition. Um, for the UK to adopt. Cool, I think that's it guys, and that's all I want to say today. We're now going to slightly meaner, so forgive me for that. Um, I'll stop sharing and then any questions?
Thank you. Thank you. We've had a couple of questions come through. Um, if anybody else wants to ask one, please feel free to type it in the question and answer section. Um, so the first one we have is from Tony Rizal from Rolls-Royce. Tony. Uh, say, Hi, Tony. Yeah, saying the LCOE equation doesn't explicitly reference build risks. For example, is Flamanville finished yet? I presume it is baked into the financing costs. Did I say that right? I hope yeah, I said that. Uh, yeah, Tony will be very familiar with that. No, Flanville isn't working yet, mate. None of, none of the EPRs are working. Um, but it is, it's all built into that cost of borrowing equation. And clearly the cost of borrowing goes up dramatically the longer your build cycle is and the longer any return on investment through generating comes in. So in the LCOE, it's all wrapped into that cost of borrowing number. And then we've had another question, thanks for that, saying what are the key challenges in SMRs that may be aerospace technology can help you, e.g. optimization of the steam turbine is our responsibility? No, so the steam turbine is, is clearly it's, a, it's an identifiable technology, but it is a, is a very different technology that has a, had a very uh, different investment stream to to the, the types of turbine that we do in Rolls Royce. It, it is basically wet steam it has to manage. So the materials are different, the environmental conditions are different. The fact that it's a big blade that spins on, a, on an axis is probably the only thing that I share. Where Rolls comes into play, the, the big the big benefits we get from Rolls Royce is a well, it's three really. A, it's the nuclear element of Rolls Royce, so we gain a big element. Of Our plant bears no resemblance at all to the military plant. However, the skills are transferable and usable. Rolls Royce's analytical capability across the whole group is key to us. The way we do analysis, the way we manage design, the way we link that analysis to design conclusions is, is not easy to do. It is a high barrier to entry, it is a real strength of Rolls Royce. And so we lever heavily on that. And, and then the biggest one is our manufacturing capability. Understanding flow line, understanding factory optimization, understanding high production rate at quality, understanding high production rate at quality on safety critical equipment um, puts us in a, again, it's a very high barrier to entry and is a, is a key expertise Rolls Royce has. So they're the sort of three chunks that Rolls Royce brings that are key market differentiators for us. Thank you. We've had another one from Mike saying, is Rolls Royce planning on operating the plants or handovers to the likes of EDF Energy? Yeah, so no, Rolls, Rolls or the consortium won't, won't operate the plant. We might get involved with development of the plant, um, but other utilities, it's, it's unlikely. EDF may come to the party, but EDF are a French company and, and see us as a direct competitor. So EDF Energy, the UK, and may, up, may end up in, in time operating some of the plants. My best advice at this thing is play, companies like Vattenfall, Exelon, uh, some of the Nordic operating companies will come to the UK to, to operate these plants. But it will be, a, could potentially be a slightly different operating model than, than you think in that quite a lot of these units may not drive grid production, they may drive industrial processes. So hydrogen production, SAF production, data centers. So the owner of these power stations might be big petrochemical companies, people like Microsoft and Google, in which case they will employ their own operator of choice to come and operate those plants on their behalf. They will not be grid connected um, and they will service an industrial need. So, so, you know, as I indicated up front, the, the potential market for these is, is more than potential just power generation for grid production. I can't hear you, you're, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, and we have a question from Martin saying, is concept design and systems all finalised? Yeah, so we are essentially at the end of, of PCD. So I've, I've, I've modified the Rolls Royce process slightly in that we have less options open at this stage. 
we're about to enter final concert design which will run for about a year and I've still got an element of optioneering in the system arena to do in that period most of that is around conversations with the regulator about what their demands are so I will have a finalized single solution where all of the options have been worked out around Q3 22 and then we enter the detailed design phase. We have a question from Tim Robs Robinson saying great talk. Can you say something about the Rolls-Royce and the UK Space Agency study on nuclear propulsion slash power? Presumably it is levering leveraging SMR tech for space missions. Right, so actually the guys dealing with that, are, so the scale of that is, is, is different. So we have some overlap in fuel. Um, and certainly there are there are programs around what we're calling intrinsically safe fuel, which means that it's it's unmeltable. You can never get a meltdown because because the fuel is, is a ceramic base. So the, clearly the fuels you put in space, you'd want to have a the similar characteristics. If there was an accident at launch, then you wouldn't want that fuel dispersed or burning or melting un, under the large fire that would ensue. So we have a crossover in the fuel area. But the guys developing that technology, because it is so compact, because the power density is so high, is, is the guys in the submarine business. So we, we have a view from a fuel side of life, but the actual systems plan um, and the concepts are all driven by the, by the subs guys. Thank you. Turn that off. That's OK. We've had a question asking, is it possible to use the heat to go into the cooling towers to use a thermonic process to produce electricity with at least come of the waste heat? Right, so waste heat, interesting, interesting, uh, interesting point and a potential strong economic area. So there's a number of places we can take heat from. We can take heat from the third stage of the of the turbine and um, that would be at around 190 degrees C and that could drive any industrial process at that temperature. And also it would be good for district heating solutions if you wish to heat towns and, 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 and cities. We can then take the waste heat from the the um, cooling towers and then you can, like I mentioned, you can do market gardening with it and dry greenhouses or, or low temperature application. There's typically not enough to recycle into the power station to actually give me a thermal hydraulic advantage in doing that. Having said that, if you attach one of these to a data center, there is so much waste heat coming off the of the data center, you can actually take that heat to do precisely what you're saying and give me a thermal advantage within the power station. So some of this depends on what the end application is and we might be able to use some of those processes as a waste product of of the of the service that we are we are facilitating. Thank you. And we've got one from Nigel who is ex Rolls Royce saying how scalable is the SMR solution? How many 500 megawatts modules could be combined in one installation? Right, so we, we wouldn't typically, so part of the problem you've got is, so why why is it, I've, I've talked about why is it the size it, it is from a, from a physical size point of view. The other thing is complexity of build. If you get much bigger so what we're seeing within, you know, Tony's question about the EPR, what we're seeing within the EPR is they're, they're fantastic designs, but they are so complicated. You know, I've got 45, mega configurable, 45 million configurable parts. They've got close to 90 million configurable parts. It just becomes an insoluble build problem. So we looked at this about whether we should offer multiple units with combined facilities, combined systems, and we came to the conclusion, and, and the economics drove this, is if you want a gigawatt, then you buy two, and we will build you two. 
and that is the most economic way of doing it and and some of the overseas clients that we're already talking to are bought into that concept so where they want multiple gigawatts we will build four to six and it is by far the most economic way of doing it than try and combine combined systems because any design change costs you a lot of money and gives you a regulatory problem. Thank you. We've got another question from Mike saying, are there any direct competitors or has Rolls-Royce got a good lead on the market? So in the UK, we've got a good lead on the market. There are competitors. Um, there's new scale in the US. Um, G have just started looking at it. G, I don't think, I think, I think they're in the talking to the Department of Energy stage, so I don't think they're in they're, they're serious competitor. The new scale is a different type of product. So although in theory it's a competitor, it was a slightly different application to ourselves. So they're not there. The biggies are Russia, who already deployed this type of product up in the Arctic. But that's largely based on their submarine solutions, but they, they still do that in China. And clearly China is, is a is a big competitor because they just throw resource and money at it. And they have a couple of SMRs running already in China. But the market is quite an interesting one because our market estimate, well not our market estimate, you know, external bodies market estimate are that the market for this is five to six hundred units globally as a minimum if we are to meet the decarbonisation targets. On that basis, we can't service that market. I want some competitors. We need some competitors to come in and start taking some of that load. I also need some competitors to keep us honest. If you are a monopoly position, um, you tend to get sloppy and, and you need competitors to keep you honest and keep you hungry. But we are in a very good position in the UK we're going to be the lead product going through the regulatory cycle and that puts us four years ahead of anybody else. Um, we are a Western solution. Again, that puts in a very good, very good position for people that don't want to take on Russian or Chinese solutions. Um, and we're trying to be first to market. So I think we're in a winning position. Uh, just following on from that, thank you. We've got a question, a question from an anonymous person saying, with your experience in naval vessels, can you see a reintroduction of nuclear merchant shipping? One problem, one problem probably is the fact some countries are nuclear free, so would not allow access to their ports. On a related topic, are there any plans for floating power plants? Russia has at least one and the Chinese are looking into them. So let's deal with the ship one first. My general view is there are better ways to power, power commercial ships. Nu nuclear is very good for submersible vessels that, where you need air independent propulsion. Um, for commercial vessels, there are more cost effective ways of even in low carbon space driving, driving ships around the ocean. So I don't think you're going to see, there's, there's no requirement. I mean, the big advantage you could run them at very high speed, but there's no requirement for merchant vessels to be running at 40 knots. Um, so I don't think you'll see that. In terms of floating power stations, barge mounted units, Rolls Royce, in fact, in fact my father designed a, a barge mounted um, power station. So we do actually have a Rolls Royce does have a barge mounted solution on the books, but you hit certainly in the western regimes big regulatory hurdles if it's floating it can sink and this is a problem for a nuclear reactor um, if it's floating and you have a fire again it is a problem to do it if you're floating and the plane lands on it you sink again so if you're floating you are very you're not very resilient to tsunami um, so there's a number of external hazard issues that, that mean that in a Western context, it's not an idealised solution because you have to build protections around it, which means you may as well build it on land. In regulatory regimes that are less mature than, than those in the West or where 
you have rivers that are sufficiently large that essentially you're talking about an inland um, usage of a floating reactor, then there, there are some applications for it. But again, you soon stumble across the question of cost and to mount anything on a barge with the safety systems you require, you have to start getting the power density of the reactor up, which means you start hitting preparation problems, which means you start driving cost. So they do have them. I don't think they will be taken up widely. Thank you. We've got a question from Hussain saying, very interesting presentation, thank you. Have you given a thought on how you will dispose of the nuclear waste from the SMRs, given that it will require refueling every one and a half to two years? Yeah, so with that, we're now driven by stuff that's sort of without, without design gift. Um, this, this, we're now hard up against UK government policy. So the way we deal with fuel in the UK, in the UK is we refuel it. I was slightly less detailed when I, we actually use the fuel three times. So, so when we do a refueling exercise, there is an element of new fuel that goes in, but most of the fuel is swapped in position. And we could talk about power shapes and all sorts of stuff in the reactor, but we won't. But basically we use it, we burn the fuel three times. It then goes from <clears throat> the reactor in, into, the, into the storage pond and nuclear fuel has decay heat, which means it, it stays hot due to normal radioactive decay, um, ranging from about 8% of full power at point of shutdown, and it will decay to something like normal ambient losses after about six years. So after about six years, the, the fuel is, is cool enough in terms of its radioactive decay and in terms of its actual physical temperature to store in solid form. So we take it out of the pond and part of the picture that, that I couldn't detail too much was that was the gravity and encapsulation plant. We then put it in a long term storage vessel and grout it and encapsulate it, take that out and put it on hard standing um, outside of the power station. Now the current government policy is that they will have a long term deep depository, which means they'll put it on the ground for forever. That facility has not yet been built, so we are required to build a large concrete pad big enough to take the entire, the entire lifetime's worth of fuel. And then once it'll sit there and then get moved to the deep repository when the UK chooses to do so or develop a reprocessing method, and that's the way we do it. Um, but you've got, you've got to understand, pe people worry about the size of this stuff. Pinky Point, which is a 1.3 gigawatt, will burn a 8 centimetre cube of fuel per day. That's it for, for 1.3 gigawatts, which is most of London. So the volumes that we're talking about is not significant. All of the fuel encapsulated will fit in one and a half Olympic swimming pools per unit. So we're not talking big amounts of fuel here. Um, but yeah, we will be compliant and then we have to be compliant. When we sell overseas, we'll just be compliant with with what the um, local regime is. And we have a question from Tim, sort of following on from that, saying, mm -hmm. is the government fully committed to the SMR programme? Yeah, so that's indicated by the, the the 210 million we've just got is the biggest UKRI research grant that's ever been issued. We are number three, so you so that's a pretty good indication. The second indication is you'll have seen Boris Johnson's um, list of ten things to to turn the economy green. We're number three on that list, as mentioned by the Prime Minister. So again, that's pretty pretty compelling. We've been invited to be significant in involvement in COP26. So again, that's a pretty good. So we're, we're pretty we're pretty happy that the government is fully behind us on this one. Thank you. And we've got a question from Pete saying, how would you describe the maturity status of design slash make suppliers in general? 
Right, so this, this, is, well, this is an interesting one. So you have to split this into UK and global. If I, if I, if I go to a global supply chain, I can buy every part of this plant now from a mature, a mature supplier within, within the global supply chain. Our intention, however, is to maximise, because the UK government are, are funding large parts of this and you know, we are a UK company and building in the UK, it is our intention to maximise the use of the UK supply chain. For non-safety critical, for non-nuclear products, the supply chain is pretty good and mature. For high safety demand, high nuclear implicated products, it's, it's not as strong as it should be. Um, and part of our program, in fact, the critical path through our program is the, is the development of that UK supply chain to both provide the, the level of quality required, but also as important, the volume rate that we require for multiple, continue, multiple consecutive builds. Thank you. We have another question from Tony saying, if I'm allowed a second question, are you designing the SMR for decommissioning and controlling the associated costs? Yeah, so again, good good point, Tony. Um, yeah, so the modularization is, not only does it buy me the capability to commoditize the plant, it also allows me to control the decommissioning costs because now I'm, <clears throat> because I'm not stick building, because I'm building on a module basis, you can decommission on a module basis as well. So stripping out the plant down to the containment structure is a very straightforward activity. The containment structure itself, we've, we've got down to very small sizes. It's, it's around 31 meters diameter. Um, and again, is, the reactor plant is built on a still slightly stick built, but again, built on a more modular principle. So again, that comes out in large chunks, large shielded chunks. So yeah, minimizing the decommissioning levy, because if you're in the nuclear game, you have and the utility has to pay a decommissioning levy to the government to, to offset um, the decommissioning costs. So we are driving as part of the market attraction, getting the decommissioning levy as low as possible. Thank you. And we have another quite interesting question saying, do you see in time to come that the molten salt reactors being developed in Canada may be a valid, safe alternative SMR? Right, molten salt. When I, it's interesting, when I started this, I would have, you know, I, I, I would have loved to. So we're, we're building a PWR, a standard three lit PWR. It's not, I'm a nuclear engineer, I, you know, that's not the reactor I wanted to build. That's, that's the reactor that the economics told me I had to build. I would have quite liked to build a molten salt. Yes and no. I think it's a valid technology. I think it's a good and sound technology. I think the economics will kill it because as I mentioned, you need the investment in the waste disposal. So what, what drove us to the design we've got is that the world's infrastructure is, you know, to, to the waste question, is in the production and disposal of pressurised water reactor fuel. That's essentially what everybody got in the world. If you're changing to a new technology where now you've got to deal with highly active molten so sodium, um, entirely different waste stream, big investment required. So yes, it could get there, but it would need multiple governments to decide they want to invest in the support infrastructure. Thank you. And we have a question asking, do you have any views on cold fusion? Is it working anywhere? Cold fusion, you know, my general view, so let, let's deal with it in two. We, we, we have a very good relationship with the guys at Cullen um, and we, we talk to them who are dealing with normal fusion um, and we, we talk to them about where they might get to in productionization because my power station actually I could change the reactor for another reactor or a fusion system without too much modification to the power station. So we have a very good relationship with the guys at Cullen and we, and we help each other out. I th they're, they're still in the 
in the R stage. They're not even in the T stage. They're still in the, and that's in the tokamak. I think their most sustained reaction is some parts of a second. Um, so they are a long way off a sustainable power solution within normal fusion. Cold fusion is is almost like a perpetual motion machine. I'm not sure the physics of it work adequately. So no, I don't think cold fusion is anything we'll see in a hundred years. I think we'll perhaps see fusion within 25 years. Um, cold fusion is a long way off, I think, if the physics of it eventually work. Mm. And we've had one last question saying, are there any plans to reprocess the fuel like the old Thorpe plant? So the answer is no, Thorpe is now decommissioned. So Thorpe has gone. Um, there is no capability within, I think there's still a capability in the US and perhaps one in France. And that's mainly around using up the plutonium stock. Um, no, it is by far the best solution to safely encapsulate it and then bury it. OK, um, great. <laughs> Thank you. And that's all the questions we've got. Thanks cool. for that great lecture. I'll just hand over now to Chris uh, for a vote of thanks. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I'm sort of Chris Chief on the uh, uh, Derby Royal Aero Branch Honourable Secretary. It's, it's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you for, for taking us uh, through that. Um, you know, I think you, you set the scene very nicely with the need for the low carbon world and, and how uh, innovative, green, reliable, continuous energy um, solutions are necessary, which is the problem I have with a lot of green suggestions that uh, to have something that uh, you know is 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 continuous looks fantastic. And the market um, influences were fascinating, actually, what is necessary to make it both sort of you know a technical success um, and uh, at an affordable cost. So uh, the innovation and the the description of the, of the balancing the risk, both financial and um, technical was was uh, you know, really very, very interesting. And, and thank you very much for describing the, the technology and the product. So on behalf of the Derby Royal Aero branch, I'd like to thank you very much for that.